How many people can openly say you know that God is good? Let's give him a clap of praise. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we are humbled to be here. Because of your greatness, Father, we are able to be. We thank you, Almighty God, that you love us in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. Father, in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, I rebuke off any burden from any shoulder that's in this house. God, I pray that every person will be able to hear and receive your word today exactly how you meant for them to. Every problem, every weight, every sickness, every disease, every issue, every pain, every enemy, may it be erased from our memory right now so that nothing hinders us receiving your word. Father, I pray that I not be seen nor heard, but that you would be seen doing the work. God, may you alone get all of the honor, all of the glory, and all of the praise, all of the time. You alone are worthy. God, I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would be felt by every person in this place. And as our children learn this morning, Father, that you would bless the teachers to teach in ways that you desire them to, and the children to receive in ways that you desire them to. And what they learn today, may it always go with them. We thank you, Father, that it will never be taken. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. <laughs> he alone is worthy. All right, if you, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to begin with the 12th verse. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Excuse me. Philippians 2, verse 12. We believe, at least it is my personal belief as the pastor here, that Church is the time to come together, to fellowship, to grow, to love one another, to deepen our relationship with Christ. It's in all of that being said, it really is our training ground as disciples of Christ. And we must be used to talking to one another here so that when we get out there into the actual battlefield, we have experience. So look at somebody around you and say, we will be talking. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, when you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. <clears throat> According to the word of God, it, 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 listen, it's God's word, which is why it's so good. This is what it says. According to the word of God, when it comes to shining as stars. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do how much, church? Now watch this. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Verse 18, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Isn't it a lot easier to be glad and rejoice when we're not arguing? Amen. Verse 14, look at it for a moment. It says, do how much? Do everything without complaining or arguing. Some of us may have complained about coming to church this morning. Amen? Some of us may argue about not wanting to go and the other one wanted to go. 
According to the scripture, Paul says we're to do everything without complaining or arguing. And there's a benefit to that because a lot more people are going to listen to the gospel fly out of your mouth when you're not complaining or arguing 15 minutes earlier. Amen? Amen? Have you ever, have you ever been around a group of people and, and your, your children were with you and you're trying to uphold a certain reputation? You know, you don't want your kids looking like they're all over the walls and stuff like that. And, and you see them, you know your kids like no one else knows your kids, and you see them put it in wall mode, they're going to start bouncing. And you try to dismantle that bounce real quick. You look and give them a look, and they look back at you like they're going to test you. And so you got to just get a little fierceness in your voice, and you, don't you dare. And in the process of you doing that, you turn around, and there's someone standing right there listening to you whip your kids with your language. Anybody ever had that happen? Do how much? Everything. Without complaining or arguing. I'm not saying not to chastise your kid because every good father chastises his children. That's how we love them. That's how we correct them. Amen? But what I'm saying is when it comes down to just everyday life, we really need to be careful of what we allow ourselves to be triggered into, into moments of anger. Because far too easily we end up in that position if we're honest with one another. Amen? We have to be really, really careful, especially those who struggle with that temptation and with that sin. With that being said, look back at verse 15, please, church. Verse 15 says this. The reason we're not to complain or argue is in verse 15, and Paul says, Paul writes, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Now, this, this is what I want to focus on at uh, the end of verse 15. Paul writes, in which you shine like the stars in the universe. Look at your neighbor and say, that's us. I mean, think about what Paul is, is, is writing here to the church. He says, in which you when, you, when you go without complaining, when you go without arguing, when we become blameless through Christ and pure children of God through the righteousness of Christ, he says, in which you will shine like stars in the universe. Now, as Christians... According to this letter Paul is writing, we are to shine like stars in the universe. But verse 16 gives a reason for it. Look at the 16th verse, Philippians 2, 16. Because 15 says we're to shine like the stars in the universe. Verse 16 says, as you hold out the word of what? As you hold out the word of life. And I found that, I found that phrase, hold out the word of life, very interesting. So, so I looked it up in the Greek text. And in the Greek text, it's, it doesn't say that you... You hold out the word of life. It says that you hold up the word of life. And the reason you hold up the word of life is because you're saying, does anybody want some? Does anybody want some of what I've got in Christ? Does, does anybody want some? Have you ever seen someone offer something and they hold it up? See, if you hold it out, something may be in your way. May not everybody be able to see what you've got in front of you. But if you hold it up, When we raise flags, which way do they go? And Paul writes in this letter, according to the Greek text, he says that you should shine like stars, Christians. You should shine like stars in the universe as you hold up the word of life. Does anybody want some? Does anybody want some of what I've got in Christ? Does anybody want? And he says we should take what we have in Christ and we should take that word of life and we should elevate it in our lives. We should, we should literally lift it up. And what that means is, church, is that we must get the message of the cross out to the lost. We must get the message of the cross out to the unsaved, to the sick, to the dying before it's too late. There's a reason that we hold out the word of life so that we shine like stars because we've been placed in a dark world. Look at your neighbor and say you're supposed to shine. See, the liberal world, the world, the world without God, the world without Christ, how many of you know that Satan tries to imitate everything God does? I mean, it's all through Scripture. If God does it, Satan wants to do it. I mean, he's going to try to imitate it. He's going to try to simulate it. He's going to try to make it that way so people are drawn to him. Let me tell you why Satan does that. Satan knows that God is good and God is perfect. That's why Satan wanted to be better than God, but he couldn't, amen? And so Satan said, man, this is incredible. I want everything that's going on here, and I'm going to try to do my own little thing. 
And so according to the word of God, Satan is the prince of this earth. We know that, right? And if you look at the, if you look at the liberal world, the, 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 the unsaved world, if you, if, if you really focus on it, you see that those that are not saved, that are, that are fooled by the enemy, they too try to shine. But they just try to shine in different ways. By what they drive, by what they wear, by the houses they have. Everybody wants to feel good about themselves, amen? The difference between the saved and the unsaved is this. The saved can get to the point to where they say, just like we sang in that, in that song, Christ is enough. Christ is enough. And I take what I have in Christ, that being the word of life, and Paul writes to the church and he says, take it and lift it up. Christ is absolutely enough. Now, I want to prove this to you elsewhere in Scripture, Paul writing again. But look at verse 15 and 16 before we move on. If verses 15 and 16 that we just, re that we just uh, reviewed, if they make you nervous and, and, and you're thinking, how can I speak to people about Christ and the message of the cross? How can I shine? I, I, I'm an inward person. I, I don't want people looking at me. Here's the good news. When you shine for Christ, no one looks at you anyway. They're seeing Christ. No one, look, no one sees you anyway. They see, that's why every time before I get up on the stage, I pray, God, may I not be seen or heard. It, it should be the light of Christ. The love of the Lord. Amen? Passion and zeal that we have for Almighty God. So if you're, if you're here and you're thinking, oh, I can't shine, I tell your neighbor, that's a lie. If you're here and you're feeling that way, church, verse 13 is where you need to draw your strength. Look at, look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. This is where you should get your strength if you feel like you can't shine for the Lord and let God work through you. Philippians chapter 2, 13, Paul writing to the church says, For it is who that works in you. <sighs> Tell your neighbor, you don't have to do it. I mean, listen, listen, listen. Church, you don't have to carry the burden of thinking you've got to do everything. Look at what scripture says. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Amen? It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. That word act there is very important because the word action means do something. Amen? And what it is saying is God is willing to do the work through you, but all you have to be willing to do is let him shine. All you have to really literally be willing to do is let God work. And according to his scripture, God will act. God will work in you according not to our plan, not to our purpose, but according to Philippians 2.13, Paul says to God's good purpose. Now, if you're willing to do the work of Christ, Christ is willing to shine through you. Paul says that we should all shine like stars from the what? Universe. Philippians 2, we just read it. In the second chapter there, we just read it, that we should shine like stars in the universe. I say this not to boast in myself, but let me just boast in how good my God is. Can I do that? Amen. But I've learned that it doesn't matter whether I have permission or not. When you boast in the Lord, you should do it. Amen? Amen? See, the reason the church has fallen to where it falls is because they think that they need the respect of the world. You don't need the respect of the world. You need the respect of God, right? Now, God reverence no man, but he will honor those who honor him. Amen? Amen? Don't let anybody ever shut you up on the good deeds that God does in your life. Recently, I got invited to go on a vacation with some folks this past week, so we went. We come to the Virginia-North Carolina line. We're leaving Virginia going into the fine state of North Carolina. There's a toll at the state line. I had to pay them folks three of my dollars. Three dollars. You complain about a 50 cent toll, 75, they wanted three dollars. So I pull up into the full service window and the lady says, that's gonna be three bucks. I said, great day, three bucks. Am I getting a fry and a drink with that too? And she looked at me and she said, in a few more weeks, it's gonna be eight dollars. I said, are you serious? She said, yeah. I said, great. Day. Look in my side mirror and won't nobody coming. So I look at the lady, I say, Are you saved? She said, Nah. 
we were following two other vehicles. At those times, those two vehicles had left. But at that time, I wasn't worried about following nobody else other than Christ. I said, you saved? She said, no. I said, do you want to be? She said, well, uh, she goes into thank mode. And I'm thinking, praise God, at least she's thinking about it. I said, why aren't you saved? She said, I don't know. She said, I can't go to church on Sundays because I'm always stuck in this booth. I said, you can have church in that booth. But the important thing, lady, is, is that you get saved. Now, I kept pressing her in love, but I wasn't going to give her time to say no. I look in my side mirror, there's traffic coming. But don't you know when you do the work of God, God will keep everybody else out your way? There was only, there was only two lanes to come for full service, the one beside me and the one I was in. Now, you know good and well, every time you go to a toll, you go for the long lane or the short lane. Mine was the shortest lane, one with one car in it. But I truly believe God had something blocking that I couldn't see. But everybody else was swerving and getting in the long line. And that's how I knew it was God. That's how I knew it was God. So I looked at her again and I said, I said, but lady, I said, you need Jesus before you're worried about going to church right now. You, you can have all the excuses not going to church, but, but, but you need Jesus. Do you want him? She looked at me again and she said, well, yes. Why not? And I said, held out my hand out the window. I said, will you hold my hand? And she said, sure. So she reaches out and she holds my hand. And we grasp hands. And I said, pray after me. And I began to pray the prayer of salvation. And she began to repeat it right outside that window. The lady on the other side of the booth was watching. What's going on over there? Leader in the salvation. She says amen. She lifts her head up. Looks like a changed person. That's how you know it's real. When, when you pray for joy and joy comes, that's how you know God was all over it. My wife, my wife is sitting right there. She starts digging through the little compartment in the Jeep, and she finds a church card, an invite card. She says, here, take this. Get this to her. So we give that to her. And I said, look, look, you can log on to the website, and you get on the YouTube, and you don't, you don't have a church right now, but you could can, you can be a part of our church. You can go in there and check any sermon out you want to check out. She said, really? I said, yeah. She said, thank you. Look over, and the wife's still digging. Wife found her favorite CD. She said, here, give her this. I was like, what? Go on, girl. This really is God. <laughs> See, the wife said, that's for you, too. Now, the beginning, of this, the beginning of this testimony started out me receiving something from her. Oh, we going to get fries and a, and a burger with that? But do you see how the Lord gave her everything she needed? Everything she needed. A hand to hold. Someone to pray with. Music. An invitation card to a church that she may never physically attend here, but she may be watching. Everything that goes on in here. I looked at her, and I, I got her name, and I, I said, look, I may, I may never see you again on this earth. I got a little saying that I tell people when I leave them. If I know I, I may not see them again, I say, I may, I may not see you here or there, but I will see you in the air. I may not see you here or there, sister, but I will see you in the air. See, if, if we're willing to let the power of God work in us, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, you will shine like stars. But there's something we have to do when we shine like stars, because in the 16th verse, he says, it's, it's when we lift up the word of life. It would be like walking outside and it being pitch dark, and you see, you see a light piercing through your woods, and out of curiosity, the only thing you're drawn to is what's in the darkness, and it's that light, and you're thinking, what is that? What is that? Something, something's in there. What is that? When you roll up into a dark situation and you allow Christ to shine through you, the unsaved, according to Scripture says, they think the message of the cross is foolish. But when God is working on that person who thinks it's foolish, they see the light come out of, out of you in a dark situation, and they say, what, what's he got? What is she, what has she got? I can remember walking across a parking lot. It's been probably 15 years ago. And it was probably about 2 in the morning. 
And before I got, got, got walking across the parking lot, I sat in my truck, and I was at the far end, one of the last lanes, and it was probably 150, 200 yards to where I needed to go walk to, to, to go past the security booth to get into a warehouse. And right there, in the darkness of my truck, I just began to worship and talk with the Lord. And see, when you do that, it's like charging up your cell phone. The light on it, on the battery level goes up. Amen? I wonder if we treated our spiritual battery the way we treated our cell phone battery, how much more of us will be doing what we need to be doing. Oh, we get so worried about, hope my iPod's charged, and I need my phone charged, and I need my tablet charged, and I need my laptop charged. We, cha we charge everything we got except ourselves sometimes. How many people's guilty of that? We charge other people before we charge ourselves sometimes. And I was just in there charging up inside that truck. And I'll tell you why I was doing it, to be quite honest with you, because a week or two earlier, I went during the daytime, and I went inside this warehouse, and people were making fun of my shoes. 20-some years old at the time, people was really making fun of what I had on my feet. And they were other grown men. I didn't go out and buy new shoes for somebody else to look on my feet. I kept them shoes on. So I'm sitting in the truck. I'm just praying, Lord, don't, don't let them attack me today. Don't let them assault me today with, with laughing at me and, and stuff like that on this, on this night crew. And it's a different crew. And I just, God, I just pray. And I'm just in there worshiping. I get out the truck and I walk about, like I say, 150 yards or so. And I step up to the guard desk, the guard shack. And the woman, the woman inside of it, I'll never forget it. She said, you're, you're a Christian, ain't you? And I said, are you? She said, no. Nah. She said, but I could tell because the whole time you walked around this parking lot, it was like a light was coming out of you. It'd be real easy for a saved person to say that. Oh, you just look so happy come across the parking lot. But for the unsaved that think it's foolish, that's the power of God. Not boasting on myself boasting on the great God that we serve. Paul says if, if you're willing to lift up, if you're willing to lift up the word of life, he says you will shine like stars. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for me, uh, church, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at the first verse. Paul again in this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, God is good, amen? <laughs> Glory be to God alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, the word of God says this, church. <clears throat> when I came to you, brothers, Paul says, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm going to tell you, church, if there's something that you need to know, that's going to just about be it. Amen? Paul says, I, I, didn't, I didn't come with eloquence or, or superior wisdom, but the only thing that I wanted to know was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. I've got to stop for a minute because as I'm reading, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said that there is a man in this room that feels like he's not worthy to be used. And he showed me it's on this side. Matter of fact, he's in the first section. Look. Listen. Don't you ever feel like God will not use you? Matter of fact, he showed me who it is. And if you're, it, look, you know who you are, and if you're willing to stay after and talk with me, I got something for you. Don't ever feel like you're not worthy enough to be used by God. Paul says, I don't have eloquent speech. I don't have superior wisdom. But there's one thing, there's one thing that I, that I have to know. And that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Don't ever feel, don't ever feel 
like you're not good enough, like you're not smart enough. Paul, who wrote all those books, I mean, so many books Paul wrote in the New Testament, he did not have a degree. You know what he had? He had the Spirit of God in him. I say this so many times, but listen, church, it's truth. The Word of God says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Nothing wrong with being educated by a man in a classroom or a woman in a classroom at a college to get your degree. I'm not bashing on that at all. But what I'm telling you is, if you're willing to learn from the Holy Spirit today, he's willing to teach you right now. Let me take take you back to this scripture. Verse 1 again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul, Paul writes, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or with superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not, might not rest on men's wisdom But on whose power, church? Say, neighbor, God is in control. All the time. All the time. All the time. Think about this. Look at verses 1 and 4, please. 1 Corinthians verses 1 and 4. Paul said, I didn't need eloquence or superior wisdom. He he says, "I, I, I I don't need wise and persuasive words. And he said in verse 2, look at verse 2. He said in verse 2, All I needed was to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want to show you in God's word, church, why that's all Paul needed. There's there's a reason Paul says, all I need to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that's it. And if we're going to do what he says in Philippians and shine like stars by lifting up the, the, the truth of life, the gospel of life, if we're going to do that and it truly be about Christ, we're going to find out why in 1 Corinthians 1.18. Look over. Most of you probably won't even have to flip a page since you're already on chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says this. This is why it all comes down to the cross. This is why if we're going to shine like a light for the Lord, this is how it's going to happen. This is why Paul says that I just need to know Jesus and him crucified. Verse 18, 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul writes and says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul said, the message of the cross is the power of God. See, you you don't need earthly wisdom or fancy words while ministering. You just need to be able to minister and share the message of the cross. And the reason that is, is because God's power is all over the message of the cross. God's power is all over the message of the cross. This is why it's so easy to approach a toll booth and share what Jesus did. Because it's not my power working at the toll booth. It's the power of who? God. Now this is scripture. This is 100% scripture. It's right there. Paul says that the power of God is with the message of the cross. This is it. Can I boast in the Lord again? Yes, I said it first. Coming out of eighth grade into ninth grade is when I begin to, is, is when I received salvation. Coming into ninth grade into tenth grade is when I got into music ministry. Tenth grade into eleventh grade, they let us go into jails and and, and we go to a youth camp or uh, programs that were going on, and we begin to do music ministry. But in the tenth and eleventh grade is when I would begin to share the word of God at these music events, and we'd, we'd share, whether it be at youth groups, whether it be at church on a Sunday morning, whether it be wherever. Found something out one day, we went into a jail. And here we are, some of us in the group couldn't even drive. And we're leading people in jail to Christ by the multitudes. You want to know what did it? It was simply the message of the cross. See, here's the secret that Satan doesn't want you to know. Listen to this. Here's the secret Satan doesn't want you to know. I'm not going to give a number because I don't want to boast of myself. I'm not, as a matter of fact, the truth is I stopped counting salvations when, we got, when, when, when I got close to 1,000. Stopped. You want to know how to lead hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord? It's easy. 
It's easy. It's the message in the cross. That's it. You tell them what Jesus did for them on that cross. And according to Paul, the power of God shows up. So many people try to convince that convince other people that Jesus is real. Well, this happened and that happened and that happened. You're wasting a lot of time. Because the more you try to argue and prove your case, Satan is on the other side of the unsaved individual trying to prove his. Oh, that's a lie. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, Grandma said. Oh, Grandpa said. You know what your daddy did. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, you want to know how to give the one good jab, the knockout punch? Go right to the cross. And if the ground is ready, the power of God shows up, and they get saved. They get saved. Hundreds, thousands, whatever you have a desire for. Someone once told me, they said, Pastor, it's not about numbers. I said, well, if you don't want someone dying in hell, it is. Now, they don't have to come to this church. To that, the number does not bother me. They just need to go to a church that preaches the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and just the truth. So I don't care what church they go to. They need to listen to the Lord and find out where God calls them. That's why I don't run, run to people's doors and knock down the doors when they, leave, when they leave here, because I want them to go where God calls them to go. And if God told that man to take his family somewhere else, who am I to get in the way of that? I don't want that chastisement. So I trust that they hear from the Lord. And it's just that easy. But if you're willing, if you're willing to take the message of the cross to an unsaved individual, watch out. Salvation starts to fall like dominoes. Now, someone in here is probably thinking, that sounds real. Uh, that's just too easy. I'm telling you what Scripture just said. It is the power of who? Let's look at it, because I don't want anyone in here thinking, whoa, 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 Pastor Lee's trying to do this on his own. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is what? Foolishness to those who are perishing. Tell your neighbor, that ain't us. Amen? Mm -mm. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of who, church? Wow. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. Hop over on the next page for a minute, please. Now watch this concerning the power of God. This is why it's so easy to lead people to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's what? See, that's not your spirit. That's a capital S. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right, look at verse 4 again. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. God bless you. Think about this. Think about this. You ever seen the Billy Graham Crusades? They still come on TV, amen? More times than not, and you wonder, how did that man get millions into salvation? How, how did he lead millions into salvation? More times than not, when that brother preached, he preached the cross. And see, you got preachers getting away from it. Everybody wants to do a series that has nothing to do with nothing. Ten weeks talking about something that doesn't matter nothing whether you're getting into heaven or not. Ten weeks just wasting time. Series on this. Series on that. Series on walking through the desert. Series on your sandals on your feet. All kinds of series out there. For what? Got nothing to do with nothing. Amen? Absolutely nothing to do with nothing. Series, 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 with nothing to do with nothing. Billy Graham was anointed because he faithfully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He faithfully preached the message of the cross. And every man that came before him that ever led millions into salvation, or thousands or hundreds of thousands, it was because they preached the message of the cross. If you got family members that still aren't saved and you want them saved, start sharing the message of the cross because that's the only thing that's got any power inside of it. It's not about why they got to come to church. It's not about what they missed in church, why they should have been in church. Don't whip them or why 
they need to read their Bible. Don't whip them on why they need to pray. They've been whipped by Satan enough. The last thing they need is the child of God whipping them. Just give them power through the power of the cross. And that's all it takes. That is all it takes. Really, that is all it takes. To glory to God alone. Listen, can, can I share my testimony some more? Yes. I've led more people to, to salvation outside of this church than I ever have in the church. And it's probably, it's probably since the start of the church, it has been a pile of people. And I praise God for that. I, pr- I really praise God for that. But you really, you really want to start leading some people to salvation? Get away from the saved folk. Amen? I mean, just go to where they need it. I mean, it, it, look, it's good that unsaved people come in here and we, we are called to lead them people to the Lord. Amen? But put me in the middle of a lot of people that don't know nothing about nothing and need to hear something about something. Think about it. This is why Paul says, Paul, listen, Paul said, he said, I don't want to preach on another man's ground. Who is Apollos? Who is Paul? He said, I don't want to preach on another man's ground where another man has sowed seed. Send me somewhere else. Man, if Paul said that. Pastors get worried about, oh, did so-and-so visit that church? Or did so-and-so go to that church? Man, listen, 70% of this county doesn't even attend the church. And that statistic is going on 10 years old. Imagine the growth that's gone, gone up since then. If pastors would spend less time worried about who's in their church and start focusing on the fact that they got more out the church and ain't coming to the church, we'd have a lot more church folk. Hmm. We've got to understand that the light of Christ the power of God will come out, but we got to be willing to let it come out. We got to be willing to allow God to do the work. We got we got to be willing to lift up the word of life. Paul said, "When you lift up that word of life, you will shine like a star in the universe. And when you shine in the darkness, church, it brings people to it." What's going on? Let me show you something else in Scripture according to this. Look at verse 4 again, please. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Everyone say demonstration. Demonstration. Think about this. Demonstration of the Spirit's power. In the very beginning of that verse, Paul says, my message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words. So tell your neighbor, you don't have to be educated. That's why I'm telling you, that is a lie from the enemy. Don't worry about not knowing whether what you're going to say is accurate or not. You just be willing to say whatever God puts in your mouth. Amen? Because if it's of God, it will be accurate every time. And don't you be worried about whether what you say will hurt someone's feelings or not. Because if it's of God... It will do whatever it's supposed to do, that being the word. Amen? So if it hurts a feeling, it was meant to hurt a feeling. If it comes with love, it was meant to come with love. But however God chooses to sow it, God's going to sow it. You just have to be willing to throw it. Amen? Hmm. Demonstration, look at verse 4, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now notice Paul says there's a key word. Paul says it's not coming in this eloquent speech. But it's coming by way of a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now, not my power, not your power, but remember, remember earlier we read in Philippians 2.13, it said it was God who works and acts in us. Amen? And so Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 2.4, there's, there's a demonstration that should be coming from every single one of our lives. Still, I say, for those that are nervous about shining for Christ and being seen by others, Just simply be willing to shine. God's power does the work. You don't have to. God will then faithfully do it through you. And if you just be bold enough to speak, God will speak through you. Let's be honest. For the sake of strengthening and being a blessing to someone else. How many people in here felt like they should have said something to someone about the Lord, but they didn't because they didn't know what to say in the moment? Appreciate your honesty. Thank you for that integrity. Didn't know what to say. 
didn't know what to say. Just didn't know what to say. When we, and I've been there, so I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at just you. I'm throwing them at me too, amen? When we get to that place, we are removing our trust off of the Lord. Because the word of God says it is the power of God that will act in us and through us. And so when we, when we think that we don't know what to do or what to say, we're relying on ourselves. And tell your neighbor, that's dangerous. I mean, that, that is dangerous. When you get to relying on yourself, it's about to get hazy. I mean, it's dangerous. When, when we take focus off of the will of God and we concentrate on our emotions, it's getting ready to get slippery. Because we are, we are removing ourselves from the strength that has gotten us to the point that we're at. And so if God places it, places it in our spirits to go witness or minister or testify, then we better go do it because he's going to provide everything that we're ever going to need in that moment. And how many people know that blessing comes from obedience and faithfulness? Amen? Turn in your Bibles to Romans 15. Paul talked about a demonstration. I want to show you something. Go to Romans chapter 15, verse 17, please, church. Romans 15, 17. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Glory to God. Let's do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. I tell you what, let's, let's go up to Romans 15. Let's start with the 14th verse. Romans 15, 14. Paul says this. He says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again. And because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by who? The Holy Spirit. Look at verse 17, because here's where the meat of the message comes in. Paul says, therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. See, nothing at all wrong boasting in the Lord. He says, I glory in Christ Jesus and my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the what, church? Spirit, capital S, talking about the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, Paul says, by the power of signs and wonders, the miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem... All the way around to Illyricum, I have fully fully proclaimed the gospel of who? Christ. Think about what the scripture is saying. Paul is saying, word has gotten around in my ministry, not because of me, Paul saying, but because what God has done through me. He said that there were signs and miracles. In the, in the book of Acts, it says that God did many miracles through Paul. God did many miracles through Paul. Everyone listen, because this is a bold statement, but this is absolutely 100% accurate. The exact same thing can happen to all of you as well. But the reason why it doesn't is because we haven't been taught that it can My parents loved us to pieces, but I wasn't raised in church. I'm not knocking them. I'm going to use you an example, all right? I wasn't raised in church. So I, growing up, elementary, middle, school, I, 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 never, I never had someone tell me, God can do this through you. God can do that through you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, never had nobody telling me, you need to do this, you need to do that, you know. Uh, the message of the cross is this. I never had nobody, never had nobody give me warning. Ne- ne- never had nobody. See, first and foremost is the message of the cross. And then after they get saved, then you can start telling them the other stuff that they got to do. And the problem is, is that many churches get the people saved great, but they don't tell them what they got to do after they get saved. 
And so they look like they look before they receive Christ. And that's a problem. But I had no one telling me the message of the cross. Much less the other stuff that came after the message of the cross. But I praise God that I got parents now that can tell me all that kind of stuff. See, tell your neighbor, it's never too late. Never too late. If God could use a ninth grade boy, that's exactly what I was, to lead adults to Christ, then he can lead every person in this room to do whatever he has to do for him. I'm telling you the secret to the whole thing right now. Someone once said, and, and, and I had to be real careful about receiving the compliment because I didn't want it to come off as, as, as sinful pride. They said, well, if we could just get him in the door, Pastor Lee will lead him to salvation. And I knew their heart was right in saying that. It was, it was not to give me credit. But let me tell you what the trick is. It's just talking about what Christ did on the cross because that's where the power of God rests. If we just tell him what he did for us. Think about it. I walk up to a man that's never been saved before, and he's tough as nails. And I look at him, and right off the bat, I know he's tough as nails, so I know i got to play hardball. And the only way you can play hardball is by the power of God. Amen? Because in our flesh, we don't have a bat big enough to swing at some of them hard folks. But God can get God can get them down to size really quick. So if I come up to a brother that's not been saved, and I know he's not, and I say, man, let me just tell you, man. And I look, I look right into their eyes. Let me borrow your eyes for a minute. He's saved, okay? He's already saved. But if I look into the, into the man's eyes and say, man, are you saved? And he says, no. Oh, then it's time to eat steak. I say, man, let me tell you what Jesus did, man. God sent his son Jesus down here in this earth just for you, just for you. And when he was on the cross, he was thinking exactly about you. And they, they, they put nails in him. They, they pierced him. They pierced him in his side. Blood and water fl- flew out. And, and, and you know what, man? The whole time he was carrying the cross for that to be, to be done, he was doing it because he loved you. He loves your kids, which is why he did it. He loves your wife, which is why he did it. And he wants you to be the leader of your family so that when you receive salvation, you can lead the whole rest of them into Christ. But it all comes down to you. And when you put that on any man's shoulders, it's thinking time. Thinking time. And it's like the Holy Spirit is up there with a baseball bat. And he's getting ready to go. Again, I cannot say it enough. Paul says, if you would take the word of life and you lift it up, who wants something? Who wants something? Who wants something? But that doesn't mean that when you leave out of here today, you go around swinging your Bible in the air and say, who wants some of this? Who wants some of this? Who wants some of this? But what it means is, is that when we're in a restaurant and when family grabs hands, and they bow their head to pray, that's you holding the word of life up, whether you know it or not. And what you and your entire family are saying is, who wants some of this? Who wants some? Who wants some? When you open the door for someone that's getting ready to come inside of a place, and you just shine the light of Christ, say, God bless you. That's you saying, who wants some? Who wants some of what I got? Who wants some? 
when someone needs help putting groceries into a vehicle and you come up and say, man, 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 I got that. You, you, you deal with your baby. Let me load these groceries for you. That, that's you saying, that's you saying, who wants some of this? Who wants some? All God desires you to do is be like Christ. That's it. He does the sign through you, church. You don't have to sign for yourself. He does it through you. Faith without works is what? And if you're willing to work for the Lord, he'll give you the strength to do it. He'll give you the light that shines. But you just got to be willing to do it. If you're here this morning and you're already saved and you're willing to say, hey, you know what? Who wants some? When I leave here today, I'm going to live my life the best that I can to glorify and honor my Father in heaven. And I'm willing to take the message of the cross and simply just take three or four minutes and tell someone what Jesus did for them and then ask them if they want to be saved. And listen, if someone says yes, there's only three little simple points that you got to make. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. And I recognize that you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven, save my soul. You don't need a whole bunch of other stuff to roll on with. Believe and confess is all you have to do. Jesus is the Son of God. And you lead someone through that prayer right there. And right there, the soul is saved. It's that easy. You didn't have to be ordained. You didn't have to go to a campus ministry. You didn't have to take an online course. You're just letting God do the work through you. What I'm going to do is, if you'd like that, and maybe you're already doing it, you want to do it even more, then through faith, I invite you to just stand up right where you are. Right where you are. Right where you are. If you're in here, and you want to be used by God, but you're not yet saved. If you're in here and you're not yet saved, now, I'm telling you, the word of God, which is the truth, says that the only way to heaven, to be with God for eternity, is through Jesus Christ. That's it. And if you're willing to let Jesus save your soul, he's willing to rescue you today. But you've got to let him do it. And all you have to do is believe it and confess it. It'll be the best decision you'll ever make in your entire life. that very moment when you receive Christ you will be in a new bloodline you will be in the bloodline of Christ that means the things that maybe your father was wrapped up in you don't have to follow anymore the things that your grandfather was hindered with you don't fall under that anymore because you're now a child of God covered by the blood of Christ and if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to save your soul but you know that you don't want to leave here without that it would be an honor if I could turn this microphone off and if I could pray with you. If you would like to receive salvation, right where you are, just raise your hand up into the air so I can see it. I don't want to miss anybody. If you're here and you recognize that you can't do it on your own anymore, you're tired of struggling, and you need Christ to lead the way. I see you, brother. Anybody else? I see you, sister. I see you in the back. Anybody else? Those three, come on up here to me. Come on up to the front. Anybody else? Anybody else? Best decision you'll ever make. Don't miss it. What we're going to do is I pray with these folks up here. This is your time to pray with God. This is your time to to just get real with your father. This is your time. This is your time. So just take a few moments, church. Speak to your heavenly father and spend some time listening as well.
Father, we we lift up lift up holy hands as you call us to in your word. We thank you, God, that that you're in control and we're not. For if if it was up to us, we'd just mess it up. We thank you, God, that you are willing to do the work in us and through us. God, we thank you for every person that is taking a stand to say, Father, use me more. Use me more. Use me more. Father, may we always remember that the the power is in the message of the cross. And rather to try to argue someone to salvation, may we just simply share what Jesus has done for us and for them. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, Amen. Can we give God a clap and shout of praise? Amen. <laughs>